In October of 1973, something very strange happened at Knott's, and Ghost Town took on a different appearance. An unusual fog began to emanate from the buildings, and freakish monsters emerged. What was happening? It was the very first Halloween haunt. Almost out of nowhere, this incredible event took shape and has become famous the world over. So what was the inspiration for the Halloween haunt, and how did it come to be? The year was 1972, when a unique idea was presented to the entertainment director of Knott's at the time, Bill Hollingshead. So when I was at Knott's Berry Farm in 1972, it was 1972, I got a call from a guy named Gary Blair, who was the, the manager of Larry Vincent, who was Seymour. Larry Vincent was best known for his campy character Seymour, a self-proclaimed master of the macabre. Seymour hosted a show on local Los Angeles television called Fright Nights. They'd run a, a, uh, an old cornball uh, monster movie and then he'd make a sides. The biggest thing about Seymour, the, the, what set him apart from every other horror host that there had been up till then, was that he was absolutely frank about what a load of crap the movies were that he was running. He called his viewers fringies, and he endlessly pointed out every flaw in his movies, insulted you for tuning in and wasting your life watching this crap. And he was hysterical. It was like Groucho Marx in a graveyard. I'll tell you, fringies, this movie is a real load. Next week's little grabber is Invasion of the Animal People. I should warn you, this movie is not as good as it sounds. People were just really into Seymour, and he became a cult figure. So Gary Blair called me up in 1972, I think around first part of September. He says, Bill, I understand you have a theater with a cinemascope screen and two movie, 35 millimeter movie projectors. Why don't we put Seymour in there and run a big Halloween event? And I thought, hey, we could do that and we could bring in the monsters. Booking Seymour into the Knott's Theater presented some very unique opportunities for them. I was called into a meeting and uh, Bill Holling said was there, and a George Condos was there, and a Martha Boyd was there, and we started talking about what we could do. And we said, this could be an incredible special event, hard ticket. And we got into about the third week of September, and we said, there's just not enough time. <laughs> it's, we, we only have about four, five, six weeks to pull this thing together. So I called Gary back and I said, call me in the spring of next year. Let's just really make something out of this. The Knott family, which controlled Knott's Berry Farm at that time, didn't care very much for the idea. At that time, there was only one person who, in the Knott family who was in favor of the idea completely from beginning to end. And remarkably, it was Walter Knott. Now we're going for the premier year, 1973. So I met with George Condos again and Martha and had conversations with Sandy Parker, who was the theater manager of what was then called the John Wayne Theater. And she said, well, you know, I have makeup artists and I have all the theater people because she was associated more with theater. And we could do costumes and we could do set designs and we could do phony, or the, or the fake cobwebs and spray and, and uh, you know, old U.S. Army camouflage netting and drape it over the, the overhangs of the shacks and make everything kind of creepy. The show was rehearsed, the park had been decorated, and the stage was set for the very first Halloween haunt. The anticipation was high and no one knew what to expect or if they would ever do this event again. Today, as people look back on the first Halloween hunt, they don't think of it as anything really big. But back then, it really was, because nobody had ever done anything like that. I just remember a lot of people come running through the gate as we opened. They were you know, running and screaming. We had to shut down the ticket box. We turned away people at the Halloween haunt. It was that popular. Seymour's show went off without a hitch and was very well received by the guests. They loved him. I mean, he was, he was just really, you know, he was applauded wildly. He was very popular at the time because he had a TV show. And so he was very popular. The place was packed. They loved him. 
seen Word Been on the Air about two years. And he was huge. He was huge. He'd already left Channel 9 for a, uh, Channel 5 for a bigger show. Fright Night with Seymour had become uh, Seymour's Monster Rally. The kids stood out in line for a long time to get the good seats of this show. And we did not have an empty seat. He was really loved. He was really loved here in, in Southern California. The success of that first year went far beyond anyone's expectation. The plan to do it again the following year was without question, and Larry Vincent was again booked as the headliner for the second annual Halloween haunt. Unfortunately, Larry was diagnosed with cancer shortly before October of 1974 and wasn't sure he was going to be able to do the show. Larry Seymour had come down with cancer, and he was in the hospital, and he was very frail, and Gary Blair said, I don't know if he can even make it, but he had had so much fun. He was gaunt, he was weak, and doing that show energized him like you wouldn't believe. You know, there was, there was a huge roar, this giant ovation for him every night, and he, he just absorbed energy from it. You, you could just see it fill him with life. As the weekend progressed, he got more and more energetic and more and more up and, and more and more like the old Larry. It was, a, it was fantastic to see. It just was the thrill of his life, and he literally got up out of a six bed. And then we had Chuck Jones, the magician. We integrated him into the show and also Mona Lisa, her look, the vamp type. Uh, yeah, like Vampira only it was Muna Lisa. So, within, so we integrated her with Larry and Larry sat on a stool at the side and he narrated the movie and then we'd take Muna Lisa and put her in one of Chuck Jones's uh, cut the lady in half and then we'd saw Muna Lisa in half and pull the part. So it was a, like a vaudeville magic movie stage show. The bit I wrote was that Seymour would, as soon as they cut her in half, you know, Chuck's already off and the Frankenstein monster and the mummy are separating her. And as soon as she's separated, I have Larry stride out, and take over the stage. And he tells the mummy, take that one and ship her to Cleveland. And take that one and ship it to Zanzibar. And they exit through opposite sides of the stage with the box. And then you never see Mona Lisa again. She doesn't even come out for a bow at the end. She's shipped off. Although Larry was very sick, he was the consummate professional and hid his illness while on stage. He was very ill at the time been in the hospital. I literally drove to the St. Joseph's Medical Center and picked him up at the hospital and drove him to Knott's Berry Farm the night before the haunts began. He got out there that first time and the audience, who did not know he was ill, they went nuts. There was no thought in his mind that that last performance at Knott's Berry Farm would in fact be as it was in fact his final performance ever in his career. Good evening, Fringies. I'd like to tell you all how glad I am to be back at Knott's Berry Farm for the second time at their Halloween haunt. I'd like to, but it's not my style. Well, Fringies, we've got quite a show for you here this evening. I've got one of my famous thrillers for you. Don't worry, this is a goodie. It's none other than the immortal Boris Karloff in The Bride of Frankenstein. For your further edification, I, Seymour, will personally narrate this film. Proj, roll the film. Well, Fringies, the time has come for me to make that dread sojourn into the world that lies out there, beyond the slimiest of walls. On behalf of Knott's Berry Farm and the John Wayne Theater, I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. I'd like to, but it's not my style. Through the wall, his television theme music would come up that we used also at Knott's. Do, 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 do. He's through the slimy wall and out, and the show is over. The following March, Larry lost his battle with cancer and passed away at the age of 50. That Larry died. Yeah, you know, he'd gotten out of his deathbed to come and do that for the three or four days. And then went back and, yeah, you know, he died. And I got up one morning and there was a note taped to my front door by my next door neighbor had left it before driving up to work and it just said three words, Larry is dead. But the last time we talked, he did tell me what he, uh, his thoughts on it. If you watch a bird, he's, this was what he actually said, if you watch a bird fly off into the sun and you can't see the bird anymore, 
It doesn't mean the bird is gone. It's just gone where you can't see it. He says, I'm flying off into the sun. After Larry's passing, the void left behind was going to be extremely difficult to fill. After all, it was Seymour that provided the main feature for the Halloween haunt. The question came up regarding how they would continue the event without him. <laughs> 